We're going to continue. Um, Harry? Harry Gambo is coming up, and I, they've asked me to remind uh, the audience, uh, especially those that have been with us the entire day, uh, that we do have an exhibit that we're going to walk to after we've uh, finished here. It's up in Haynes Hall, and we're going to go up there and go through, we'll, we'll have a small reception up there. You can have some refreshments, and then we'll go, uh, we'll be touring the exhibit of images that we've drawn from uh, La Raza photo collection, uh, Chicano Student News photo collection, and Oscar Castillo's uh, photo collection. So uh, please keep that in mind. Now we are uh, going to move on with the program, and uh, it's uh, time for Harry Gamboa. Harry was a student at Garfield High School. Yes. Mm. Not the other high school. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's, um, I do a lot of public speaking. I never use prepared notes. Uh, I wrote some notes. I'm probably going to deviate from them anyway. Um, uh, I was thinking about coming here um, all day yesterday. I've been fairly busy uh, recently doing a lot of things. But um, last night I sat down and uh, switched on television at 10 o'clock, um, turned it on to Spanish language uh, news, and a uh, little brief uh, uh, clip of ICE agents pointing machine guns at two and seven-year-old girls uh, while they're dragging their mother away and she's screaming. And then they push one of the girls down and punch the mother and push her into the car. And then it cuts to another one where they're grabbing a the mother out of the car uh, with the door shut, uh, with the babies crying. Um, and, um, and so uh, I have been really um, uh, thinking a little bit about our current condition uh, because, it, of course, it's an express, direct express attack against Chicanos and Mexicans uh, from the top administration, Trump uh, attacking uh, sanctuary states, uh, but particularly hating Mexicans and hating Chicano people. And so um, uh, I was thinking also about an uncle of mine uh, when I was very young uh, who would often cut the birthday cake uh, with a dagger that he had taken from an SS uh, stormtrooper during World War II, because uh, my uncle had been a war hero and he'd killed many Nazis, and that's how we would get the cake. And, um, um, and, and I do recall that, that my uncle had impressed me quite a bit. My mom had a number of brothers that had all served in World War II, uh, some relatives that had served in World War I. Uh, my grandfather's brothers also served in the European campaign. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit as if I ever get to reading what I wrote. Um, uh, I was kind of influenced quite a bit by uh, sort of this uh, uh, concerned, uh, uh, concern for human rights and uh, the, the, the desire and willingness to take action. Um, and this was imposed upon me uh, from birth. Uh, and there's somewhere, there's a picture of me with a baby bottle with a jalapeno floating in it. So you could tell all my family was originally from Mexico City. Um, and... Um, uh, so, uh, so just to put into context a little bit, I do want to mention also that my father was born in Mexico, brought over when he was less than a year old, um, received his citizenship after serving in, in World War II, uh, in which his name, uh, he took the, the legal name of Harry, which is why my name is Harry. His name was Enrique Carlos. My grandmother had heard somewhere along the line that the translation for Enrique was Henry. When she enrolled him in public schools here in LA, uh, she said his name was Harry. So yes, yeah, so there. And so um, anyway, I will, um, I will, uh, and by the way, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here at UCLA. Uh, it's an excellent institution. I have met so many brilliant people um, here. Uh, and of course, uh, Rosalio Munoz, who was uh, uh, leading up the Chicano Moratorium, was the student body president here. Uh, many of the many people are here. I've had the great honor to teach her every once in a while. Um, and uh, this is a really tough place. Uh, and so and just even coming here uh, proves you're tough, even to be a participant, okay? So, um, so here I will just read uh, this piece, and I might have a tendency to 
to add on to it. Oh, I must also say my father, uh, who was a worker who um, worked from, uh, you know, it was, he'd leave it when it was dark, get home when it was dark, um, actually took one day off uh, to defend me during the time of the walkouts. Um, I had been basically captured, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word, which I'll probably talk about. But uh, they were threatening to do a million things to me, whatever it was. Uh, uh, school was very harsh kind of place, a lot of physical uh, they, they used to allow what was known as corporal punishment, but it, when it got to East LA, it meant torture and physical pain, brutality, the breaking of bones, knocking out your teeth. Uh, there were two or three people that lost their eyes uh, in this process. All this to prepare you uh, to go on to who knows where they wanted to send you. Um, my father showed up wearing a suit and told the, uh, the two vice principals, uh, the associate vice principal, and the principle that uh, his son could do whatever the hell he wanted, and that's me, which is what exactly what I did. And at that point, and I know, and I do celebrate people with 4.4 GPA, and I did teach at UC Irvine where the average is 4.4 GPA, um, but I had a 0.0, .0 GPA um, <laughs> at uh, school. I never once passed a, I, I never once passed a single course from kindergarten through the 12th grade. Um, I wasn't interested in that. Um, in the third grade, uh, a teacher who was very intent on teaching me math gave me a brand new math book, uh, tried to uh, let me know the, the right way to do things, and I took this book, and the minute I got out of the, the classroom and went outside, I threw it on the ground and kicked it all over East L.A. Uh, with my friends, and, uh, and when I returned to the next day, 30% uh, uh, of the pages were gone, and the teacher said, well, you know, how did this happen? I said, well, it's all mathematical. You kick it 5,000 times, you're going to be left with 200 pages. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> and as it turns out, because I've almost never had money in my pocket, that was all the math I needed. Okay, so here. So here, we will read uh, this here. Um, so here's my piece that I wrote for Carlos. Um, and I title it, Walk Out Now. Growing up, Chicano and Boyle Heights and East LA during the 1950s through 1970s was an exhilarating experience that required great strength and resilience in order to survive the political and cultural eruptions of the era. My earliest encounters with the systemic racism that targeted Mexican-American youth took place in the kindergarten class when I was coerced into making a dunce cap that was placed atop my head after the teacher had painted the word Spanish onto it for a vertical display of mockery and threat against a boy who had not quite reached the age of five years. This would prove to be the catalyst from which I would respond to racist epithets, fascist taunts, and the endless array of social and physical brutality that was being offered as a dimly lit future that contrasted in every way to my sense of self and the respect I held for my members of my community. During the 1960s, the public schools of East, L East Los Angeles registered the lowest test scores and highest dropout rates with the least number of students who qualified to continue and to achieve in the realm of higher education. This was an effective indicator of how the public school system failed to serve and to properly educate the burgeoning population of young Chicanos who would grow from a minority concern to being the majority stakeholder in educational issues. The sterility of data-driven information has a tendency to eradicate the actual physical and perceptual components of the lived experience that might present a more compelling story of what deprivation of cultural respect and political assault means to an individual and to the community at large. And here I'll pull away from my notes. Um, it was mentioned that uh, there were shop classes that were offered at the various schools. Um, it was really high technology, but at Garfield High and at Stevenson Junior High, at the beginning of every school year, the students were, were ordered to make weapons for the teachers that were then used against the students. And they would, what they would do is they would put metal bars and plastic bars and seal them up in tennis shoes so when they beat you, it wouldn't break your bones. It would do that. Also, uh, while I was in school, in junior high school, they would bring all the boys into the, um, the, the gym, separate, uh, segregate the boys from the girls, and they would bring in military personnel telling us that we would all be dead in three to five years because of Vietnam and for us to go out and to make sure that we got our girlfriends pregnant and to start drinking and to have a really good time because we would be dead and, and that would be it and we'd have to leave something behind. And of course, um, uh, going back to this idea of having had a dunce cap, 
Uh, by the time I was in the fifth grade, I could learn to read, write, and speak better English than anyone that was at that school. Um, I would go around because I was reading the New York Times and all these things and try to convince my friends that really what they were trying to do was turn us into killers or to become killed. And uh, one of these soldiers heard me and actually uh, hurt me uh, very badly in front of all my, my, my friends. And as they were punching me, I started to laugh. And every time they hit me harder, I laughed even harder. And uh, in the end, I was left uh, extremely wounded and I couldn't stop giggling. And of course, that secured my position in East LA. Okay, so, um, yes. Uh, and by the way, I, w I must mention that when I'm looking at some of these pictures of the walkouts, that very lovely students, very beautiful people, but in that crowd, I'm not gonna point who they are, uh, you, would, you can imagine that nearly half the boys uh, would be dead in three years from Vietnam. An orthodoxy of repression was manifest in the manner by which elected officials, school administrators, police, and mainstream media responded to the needs of Chicano. In a truly despicable manner, Chicanos were being disproportionately drafted to fight in the Vietnam War while also being denied access to full education and employment opportunities on the domestic front. Although Los Angeles had promoted worldwide as being a place of affluence and manufactured celebrity, the actual effects of industrial and radioactive pollution resulting from negligence, malfeasance, and intentional experimentation directly affected the smoggy days of the late 20th century, urban fun under the sun. East LA was ground zero in a scenario that would play out as a dramatic narrative where brilliant individuals would coalesce to form a movement to improve the lives of young people by introducing the concept of Chicano as a means by which to resist the stripping away of our unique cultural references by a system that was designed to homogenize and neutralize any creative sense of self. The 1968 walkouts in East LA are often portrayed as having been a social anomaly in the timeline of California history or have been presented in lighter terms to serve the purpose uh, fictionalized uh, cinematic representations of the walkouts, commercial televisions, or even as a fading urban myth. Fortunately, scholars and historians have focused their attention to the serious events that took place at Lincoln, Roosevelt, Belmont, Wilson, and Garfield High Schools. The multi-layers of intellectual engagement and social movement activities that took place uh, were pr predicated on previous efforts to mobilize and address many issues that date back to the beginning of the 20th century. The various political factions that existed during that time represented different modes of thought and action regarding strategy, strategies to perform public acts that would reverberate throughout the Southwest and beyond. The high levels of repressive government surveillance uh, and undercover activity, and so here I must just mention also because it was kind of hinted with J. Edgar Hoover, um, uh, Paula and I, uh, and maybe a couple of other individuals who are in the room today were actually included in a Senate subcommittee report that was published uh, by the Congress uh, and approved by the President of the United States at the time. Um, and we were listed uh, and, and made reference to by uh, a secret domestic intelligence gathering unit known as PDID, in which we were referred to as being more dangerous uh, than the Black Panthers and the Communist Party combined. And we were placed on a list of 100 top 100 subversives in the United States. Um, it would be like uh, having Trump put you on a list of top 100 uh, terrorists today. So it was a very life-threatening situation. I actually had an, a, a federal agent tap me on the shoulder and ask me uh, to make sure I would read it uh, before the end of my days. I went out and purchased that copy at the federal building and it's in my archives at Stanford University if anyone gets a chance to go see it. Uh, but uh, we were actually definitely uh, cherry-picked uh, either for uh, whatever purposes they, they might want um, that 100 list is really, uh, it really is a top list. So, um, anyway. Um, the 1968 walkouts were a riveting example of what social action can achieve in redirecting a vision of self and place, thus creating a new perspective from which 
to move forward into a brighter future without ever having to turn back or to accept anything less than what is being offered to others. Um, my role in the 1968 walkouts was to participate in the cadre that was inspired by Ralph Cuaron uh, and to, and by the way, when uh, Cuar, Cuar, uh, Rita, Mita Cuaron's father was mentioned, he was mentioned only as her father, his name was Ralph Cuaron, uh, and there has been a PhD dissertation written on him, and uh, he was, uh, I guess I would have to say, kind of a far left activist. Um, there was a difference at Garfield High School and maybe Roosevelt High School because the Mounts, uh, the Mount family and Ralph Caron uh, were very much uh, involved in instructing us on multiple various theories uh, that, that, that uh, went on to express issues related to uh, existentialism, Marxism, socialism, urban planning, social theories regarding uh, propaganda, uh, kind of doing many different kinds of things. Um, and so we kind of had a different perspective than maybe some of the other schools. It was kind of a very special training, and specifically exactly what J. Edgar Hoover was talking about. He, he was an asshole, and uh, it really didn't matter because he might have been fucking right, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and, um, and so, uh, 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 so here, excuse my, well, no, don't excuse it. Um, working with Ralph Cordon to direct our proselytizing efforts to full action at Garfield High while performing before the national media via agitprop. So, uh, if you look at the uh, Los Angeles Herald Examiner, maybe a year or two before the walkouts, our cadre was out there performing and, pre and uh, protesting in front of the federal building, uh, protesting against uh, housing, uh, against uh, poor uh, uh, food conditions, poor health conditions, poor environmental conditions. Um, a lot of it involved a lot of performance kind of art. Of course, it had a dramatic effect on the trajectory I would take uh, in establishing uh, OSCO and other kind. I'm still involved in this kind of work. Uh, but also the idea of uh, infusing and, and mixing together politics and art, action, using your bodies. Uh, the walkouts was really a physical manifestation. It required everyone from all the schools and the response from the entire city, the state, and the world to respond to the fact that Chicanos were co-equal with anybody on earth, uh, that we were in tune with everyone, uh, and yet at the same time denounced by everyone and continue to be, continue to be. This is the, we are the only group that anyone would allow mothers to be kidnapped on the streets publicly. No one else in the world would allow that in any country. And we allow that to happen today. And I looked at those little girls, I saw their images, and they're the ones that will attend this school one day. You know, they will write the history of the fascists that are, that are attacking our people. So, um, I also work with Raul Ruiz on creating public, uh, creating graphic materials for Chicano Student News. So uh, they've been showing the newspaper, it's in the book. Uh, I remember inking in the hands, it's clutching there together. I was also present with Bobby Kennedy. He had a chance to talk to us. It was kind of very uh, riveting time in a way. There were many other people that passed through the Ralph Cuaron uh, uh, living room. Uh, there were uh, people like Walter Ruther from the union organizations, all these other various uh, African-American uh, uh, representatives, people from the indigenous cultures were there, people that came in from Mexico, people that came from all over the world, passed through this. Uh, the apartment complex where Ralph Caron uh, operated out of was actually owned by the Episcopalian Church and Father Luce. So it was all kind of connected, all very internationalized. Uh, that notion of being international also, the term, the terminology Chicano was actually a term by which Chicanos can also internationalize the idea that you had a very progressive and very brilliant group of people uh, coming out of there. And of course, it was during the same era that Richard Nixon and his cadre of criminals, uh, including Rumsfeld and all these other, and Kissinger, I think I saw him the other day whispering and into the current president's ear uh, to this day, came up with the, the term, that the federalized, invented term, Hispanic, to counter the utilization of Chicano. Okay, so, uh, and so, uh, again, it's a fake term, but everyone's made to say it, 
And of course, I, I feel very badly whenever I hear young Chicanos refer to themselves as Hispanic because of course the people who hated them since before they were born tricked them into saying this. I was fortunate to have been mentored also by uh, Francisca Flores uh, and Bert Corona and to have had the opportunity to engage in informal chats with Oscar Zeta Acosta, as well as with veterans of World War I, World War II, Korean War, and my contemporaries of the Vietnam War. I was impressed by the many individuals who contributed to the defense of the Pachucos during the Zoot Suit era, and was highly inspired by the many poets, artists, musicians, philosophers, and self-style-conscious -style Chicanos who spoke of their dreams and realities and the resistance dialect of Kahlo. I was introduced to many active players during the week-long 1968 activities and during the many events that followed. Uh, Freddy Resendez, 1950 to 2016, was a bright and charismatic student from Lincoln High School who introduced me to classmates Paula Cristosimo and Paul uh, uh, Bobby Verdugo and their inspiring uh, teacher, Sal Castro. Their orientation provided an alternate, an alternate perspective on how to address social injustice as well to, to proceed towards achieving some level of social and economic parity from our protest efforts. The utilization of public speaking before the LAUSD uh, school board meetings provided excellent examples of effective political oration by various community intellectuals, including Juan Gomez Quinones, Carlos Montes, and Vicky Castro, while presenting the progressive ideas and proposals in an officially recorded encounter of resistance. The intensity of commitment for La Causa was manifest in the many sacrifices that were made by the thousands of students and their families who demanded that they receive fair treatment and to be presented with educational opportunities that would result in improving the ratio of university educated Chicanos so as to broaden our full participation in a system that had proven to be so hostile and damaging to our youth. And so here, I'll just stop one more time. There are so many brilliant scholars, people that have done a lot of work, but the population has grown uh, bigger. And of course, numerically, there's more, but it still needs a lot more um, and it's so difficult now because so many, there's so many things that are interceding on the learning process for young people. I've been teaching for 30 years. Um, it's a long story how I haven't managed to get to this, but um, uh, uh, the concern for people, uh, the capacity to learn and to transform that uh, knowledge acquisition into action is what's really uh, something that should be really considered when teaching uh, because the, the reality is uh, the assaults against uh, Chicano and Mexican culture here in the United States um, has it, it's, it's actually persisted and become even worse. And the, the mere fact that anyone would put up a wall. Uh, I was in Berlin last year and everyone's celebrating that there is no wall. And I have actually was hanging out with uh, students in East Berlin, uh, my former students, uh, having a good time, and I'm going to invite them and we're going to figure out a way to knock down the new wall. Um, in 2018, the intellectual and creative base of Chicano contributions to academia, electoral politics, law, research, entrepreneurial endeavors, and the arts is widely acknowledged and service, serves to illuminate pathways for ongoing achievement. The racist and fascist orientation of the current administration and the ongoing anti-human rights activities by ICE with the accompanying privatized detainment facilities are a brutal response to the civil rights era. Fortunately, the 1968 walkouts initiated a template for educational growth and a discourse of cultural uh, affirmation that has been widely disseminated to encourage our youth to become successful participants in promoting a visibly effective humanized engagement with the 21st century in the national, international arena. It is inspiring to witness the positive effects that can be linked to the community efforts that took place half a century ago. It is important to continue our efforts in communicating the high value of educational educational achievement and to resist attempt, all attempts to restrict our rights of our youth to learn and to earn a positive place in the local and global environment. Thank you.
Now we're going to hear from uh, someone from a different generation who is doing that research that focuses in on something that happened 50 years ago and later. Uh, community action, student action, the movement continued. And it continued in other places other than Los Angeles. So uh, uh, Brian Partido, Partida, uh, graduate school of education, doctoral student, uh, is doing his dissertation on a subject that uh, we're going to have a presentation on. And the title of his presentation is Counter Stories of Phoenix Union High School in the 1970 Chicana, Chicano Boycott. Hello everyone, how's everyone doing? Good, that's good to hear. Uh, for some reason my, my title slide's not staying up, but I want to leave it up there for a few seconds just so you get an idea of what my, the focus of my work is. Like Carlos pointed out, it's definitely uh, in, uh, related to the conversations that we've been having today historically and very much uh, in contemporary discussions around education and the state of Chicanos and Chicanas. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the national conversations that we can place the 1968 Chicano Chicana movements in, uh, and that one of those being is uh, an example in Phoenix, Arizona during 1970, uh, Chicano Chicana uh, boycott of the first established high school uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. So the title of my work today is, uh, is uh, Counter Stories of Phoenix Union High School. Um, and the 1970 Chicano Chicana Boycott. I'm a fourth year doctoral student in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. And I am working with Dr. Daniel Solorzano, uh, Dr. David Garcia, Dr. Tyrone Howard, and Dr. Juan Gomez Quinones. Uh, but before I start my, my presentation, I wanted to really place uh, the work in the context of people that have really inspired this work um, and in a sense kind of brought me to where I am at now. So I feel like I wanted to dedicate this presentation to them, their life accomplishment, their achievements, and their dedication to the Chicano Chicana community in Phoenix, Arizona, and in larger uh, to the, the, the historical work that's being done for Chicanos and Chicanas. And the first person, uh, her name is Terry Cruz. Um, and interestingly enough, I can say that I have never personally met Terry Cruz. But in the process of uh, getting into this work, uh, her name came up uh, after uh, endless amount of research and trying to uncover what the, the presence of Chicanas and the contribution of Chicanas in Chicano, Chicana movements in Phoenix were. Um, uh, Danny really encouraged me to, to seek this out. And her name uh, was one that came up. And unfortunately, uh, she passed away in August of 2017 and to me, um, it really just reminded me of the urgency to do this work and the importance of being able to, to capture um, these oral histories, these accounts, uh, these experiences, um, because these are generations that are unfortunately, as time goes on, are, are going on to the next world. Um, but I wanna dedicate this work, uh, this work to her, her commitment to Chicanos por la Causa that I'll be talking about a little bit later, an organization established in Phoenix during the 1960s and 70s, um, and her ongoing work and dedication to that very day. Another person is uh, doc, uh, Dr. F. Arturo Rosales, um, uh, who is responsible for writing um, Chicano uh, book series that uh, um, corresponded to the film series. And to me, he was the first Mexican-American historian uh, that I took class with at Arizona State University. And there was countless nights that I remember going to Hayden Library uh, in the basement level, and there was the, the manuscript uh, viewing uh, the reels, uh, viewing screens, and I would see him there all the time. And this is a, a very interesting, irregular hours, right? Like you would expect professors to be home, um, you know, doing other stuff than academic work, but to me, in retrospect now, uh, as an educational historian in training, I see the dedication, I see the vigor, I see the commitment to the work that he was doing to ensure that someone was documenting uh, 
our history, right? So I also want to dedicate um, this presentation to him. He passed away in December of 2016 um, there in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. So I want to give you all an overview of my presentation today. Uh, what I'll be covering first is kind of contextualizing my research. How did I get to it? What does it mean? What does it consist of? In addition to that, I also want to talk about the ways that I'm thinking about my research. What, what, are the, what, what theories am I looking at? And how am I going about really trying to uh, construct a counter story of this 1970 Chicano Chicana boycott at Phoenix Union High School. In addition to that, I want to give you a little bit of background and context to Phoenix Union High School and the boycott that took place. And for the purpose of today's presentation and, and my work, uh, I'll be focusing on what some of my findings are and what the research has been showing in regards to archives, but particularly uh, newspapers. Uh, and I'll discuss a little bit more about how I'm using those to, to put together a narrative. Uh, and lastly, I really want to tie in uh, what this history work means in the larger sphere of the 1968 movement of uh, walkouts in East Los Angeles, but in addition to that, really putting it in a contemporary conversation of what does it mean for um, education now? What does it mean for, for public education now? And I recall uh, Mario Garcia mentioned earlier and emphasizing the, the need and, and the importance of having uh, ethnic studies in all levels of curriculum. So I feel like history work is something that should be brought to the table when it comes to um, developing that type of uh, policy changes and curriculum development, teacher development as well. So I, how I came to this work. So this is a very simple photo, as you may see. It is uh, one of the oldest markets in South Phoenix. South Phoenix is the community that I grew up in. Um, I was born in Los Angeles in 1988, East Los Angeles to be specific, Santa Marta Hospital, a historical Latino immigrant serving hospital. Um, while my parents were here in East Los Angeles in 1993, when my brother was born in Long Beach, um, um, my family moved over to Phoenix and settled there, kind of following a migration pattern, starting in Chihuahua, going to LA, and then eventually Phoenix. Um, but what's interesting about how I came to my work a few months ago, I was conceptualizing really starting off in my first year of my doctoral program, and that was uh, through taking a course with uh, one, of my, uh, one of my mentors and advisors, Dr. David Garcia, and learning about educational research methods. Uh, and in addition to that, I wanted to learn what it meant to take those research methods and apply them to my community and learn about something completely not related to my research, and that was music. I was really interested in learning about Chicano, Chicana music and culture in Phoenix, Arizona in the 1960s and 70s, right? So what I learned was that there was a, an enclave of, uh, of spaces in South Phoenix, the community that I grew up, that really uh, helped to foster black and brown uh, pride in that community that, that really channeled uh, avenues for musical acts to come through, like Ray Charles, uh, Little Joan, the Latin Airs. And they were, they were given spaces to play in South Phoenix when they were not allowed to play in, in North Phoenix due to historical segregation that was taking place, and I'll talk a little bit about later. So that's usually where I like to start off my research. But in the last, in the last few months, uh, after being a part of, uh, of this project, helping Carlos co-coordinate uh, the conference and um, really diving into the archives and helping put together um, the exhibit over at the CSRC, I really placed in conversation what I was seeing in the images and what I was reading in the newspapers with my personal experience. And it actually, it actually took me back before uh, this, uh, this first year doctoral experience that I had with music. And it took me back to 2006. And in 2006, or 2005 and 2006, I was a junior going into my senior year of high school. And I remember at that time being a student at Cesar Chavez High School, and I emphasize Cesar Chavez High School, named after a prominent leader in the Chicano Chicana community known for uh, the farm workers movement, right? At that time, I was at a point in my life where I didn't know where I was going, I didn't have any direction. Uh, which seemed to be a lot of the conversations that my friends were having. You know, what, like what is college? What do we know about it? The information was lacking, the resources were lacking. Um, but 
In 2000, uh, 2005 going to uh, 2006, I had the opportunity to enroll in a college readiness program for low-income students of color uh, in Phoenix. And what they would do was they take Phoenix Union High School District students and place them at a local community college to take college level courses. And when I was at South Mountain Community College, I took a course with Dr. Robert Sosa, who was trained in ethnic studies at Berkeley. And for the very first time, I was introduced to the 1968 walkouts. He showed us taking back the schools. And I remember in that moment where I felt lost, like I didn't have direction, it was a moment that I found myself. And it was a moment where I knew what it meant to be Chicano and and Sal Castro's work really made an impact on me because for the first time I started seeing him and the teachers that I had that weren't all teachers, they were lunch ladies, um, they were janitors, they were staff that really showed me the way to understand my education and what it meant to be culturally uh, connected to my roots. In that moment, I saw myself in those students, I saw myself in Sal Castro and I said, I was born in East Los Angeles Though that is part of my history too. Although I did not experience education in Los Angeles, the extension of Chicano, Chicano student movements was a part of me. And that inspired me to walk out of my high school in 2006 as a part of the movements that were taking place against Sense and Burner, HR 4437, that sought to criminalize all undocumented immigrants in the United States. So, in retrospect, doing this work for this conference in the exhibit really taught me that my work and my connection to this work goes back even farther. But in addition to that, when I really started doing the research and wanting to learn about Phoenix and its communities and the people of color in those communities, one of those books that I came across was Bradford Luckingham, Minorities in Phoenix. Probably the only concise book uh, written about people of color in the Phoenix area from a historical perspective. Um, in addition to that, when I was reading his book, I also came across Aslan Arizona by Darius Villacheveria. And for the very first time, I was learning about the history of Chicano Chicana movements in Phoenix, Arizona. And this was in 2006. This was in my first year of my doctoral program. So I went so many years learning about the Chicano movement in other places, and it inspired me. But when I learned about the history of Phoenix, Arizona, and the connection there, my light was reinvigorated, and I found another different purpose, and it was to do this research. So reading the terrain, the city of Phoenix, uh, the city of Phoenix has a really interesting, um, really interesting history in the larger scope of Arizona. Uh, in, com in comparison to Tucson, Arizona, um, they're, they're vastly different. Tucson, Arizona has historically been more of a, of a Mexican-founded city. Phoenix um, was kind of built up from the ground with this notion of westward expansion, uh, white settlers coming in, this erased idea of indigenous history, and then Mexican labor coming in and eventually helping to, to establish the city. So what I want to do is kind of give you a brief timeline of how things broke down. So in 1861, Phoenix, Arizona was founded, and it wasn't until about the early 1900s that the city began to kind of uh, uh, reach a, a, a more stable establishment. You start seeing more uh, racial and ethnic enclaves in the city, but this has nothing to do just because uh, people from certain racial or ethnic enclaves were gravitating to live with each other, but it was the way that the city was set up geographically to marginalize certain people. And what happened was in the late uh, 1890s, uh, the Salt River, which runs through the middle of Phoenix, started having major floods. So the white settlers that, early, that came in early started um, migrating towards the area around the river because of agricultural work. But because uh, the river started flooding, they had the resources and um, the economic ability to move to the north side of town, which was higher ground. So what that did is left all the Mexican labor and all the people of color, black African-American communities, the incoming Chinese-American population, uh, to live in the southern part of the city. So the southern part of the city then became known as South Phoenix, a historically disenfranchised and marginalized part of the city that wasn't incorporated as a larger part of the city of Phoenix until 1960. 
But education-wise, the high school that I'm focusing on, like I said, was the first established high school in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, established in 1895. So very, uh, very early on, um, but it has a very interesting history when it comes to race and racism that I'm going to point out right now. Um, but within that, there's also heavy movements around uh, legalization of segregation in the state even before Arizona became a state itself. So when it was a territory leading up to 1912 to a statehood, there was uh, different pushes and initiatives to establish legal segregation, predominantly focusing on African American black communities. But um, there was underlying tones that would lead to the segregation of Mexican American communities as well. So in 1909, Arizona Territory adopts a law requiring African students to be segregated. In 1912, Phoenix is then relocated, uh, Phoenix Union High School is then relocated to its current location, which is on Van Buren Street uh, and 7th Street. Okay, so Van Buren has become and is still, in many regards, the historical segregating line for the city of Phoenix, North and South Phoenix. So it has an interesting kind of placement geographically now. But then in 1912, Arizona finally becomes a state. And in 1913, there's another amendment to the segregation law. So territorial segregation statute incorporated as an actual state law. School boards provide broad discretion to segregate as they deem advisable. So they say, districts, you figure it out. You, it's up to you to figure out what you want to do in terms of handling students who are non-white. Right? And then in 1921, segregation law is amended once again to provide local discretion. So taking it from the state level, then giving, giving the, the power to cities, to districts, and to schools themselves. In 1925, we have what was considered one of the first Mexican-American uh, segregation cases, Romo versus Laird, which um, had to do with uh, the 10th Street School and the 8th Street School in Tempe, Arizona, actually now where Arizona State University is located. St Mexican students were not allowed to attend uh, the 10th Street School because they are Spanish-speaking or Mexican-American descent. So it was ruled um, by a judge that they must admit the four Mexican-American students into the 10th Street School and that the 8th Street School must be shut down um, because it wasn't uh, constitutional. In 1928, education uh, segregation statute is re uh, revised once again. In, uh, it requires segregation of pupils of the African race in all school other than high schools. Okay? So once again, very much a focus on the African-American black community. Doesn't really target uh, Mexican-American, but Mexican-Americans were, were encountering segregation um, or marginalization in schools in different ways. In the 1931, we have the Lemon Grove case. 1947, we have Mendes versus Westminster. Once again, in 1951, the Arizona segregation laws amended. But in addition, in 1951, we have Gonzalez versus Shealy, and in Gonzalez versus Shealy was the contestation that um, a Tolleson uh, elementary school should, uh, it is unconstitutional for them to have a separate school within a school for Mexican American students. Did it freeze? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And then in 1953, I was doing it again. Yeah. So, so I'll I'll just talk these points out. 1953. Uh, was a major pivotal um, moment for Phoenix Union High School, and that was the Phillips versus Phoenix Union High School case, which officially desegregated the high school that had been um, that had relegated African American Black students to attend the Phoenix Union Colored High School prior to that, a few streets uh, a few streets down from where Phoenix Union High School was located. So this happened prior to the 1954 uh, Brown versus Board of Education case, um, desegregating all schools across the nation. Right, theoretically. Uh, and then by 1954, after the Brown versus Board of Education, 
case, it's 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 stated that uh, the majority of the schools in the Phoenix area were desegregated, um, including uh, my local homeschool district, the Roosevelt uh, School District. But once again, it was primarily focused on ending the legal segregation of Mexican Americans, uh, excuse me, African Americans. And then 1968, then we see the the, Los, the East Los Angeles blowouts, and in 1970 we have the Chicano Chicano boycott of Phoenix Union High School. So contextualizing the research, uh, this presentation is part of the larger dissertation work that I'm doing. It's really focusing on taking archival documents such as newspapers, district documents, and oral histories to compose a counter story centering the racialized experience of Chicanas and Chicanas during a month long boycott of Phoenix Unit High School in 1970. So I use a critical race theory lens and a critical race educational history lens uh, to couple with the newspapers to find particular uh, ways to analyze the socioeconomic context of the community pertaining to Phoenix Union High School, constructing a narrative around the organizing strategies of the boycott, ultimately looking at the outcomes of the boycott itself. So how I frame my research is using these three questions. So I ask, what is the socioeconomic context of the community surrounding Phoenix Union High School in the period of 1970? Um, the 1970 Chicano Chicano boycott. What is the socioeconomic context of Phoenix uh, Union High School's attendance boundaries in the period of the boycott? In addition, how and why was the Phoenix Union High School uh, boycott organized and who were the main stakeholders behind the organizational efforts? And what were the outcomes of the 1970 Phoenix Union uh, High School boycott itself? Did the Phoenix Union High School District meet the demands and the needs of the Chicano Chicano students and community? So when I was thinking about what this research meant, I wanted to place it in conversation with um, the history of walkouts that were taking place from 1968 to 1970. And what I started doing is mapping it out. So we have the 1968 blowouts, right, in East Los Angeles. But around the same time, we also had uh, walkouts taking place at Roosevelt Junior High School in San Jose, California. Uh, we also had the movements by students in Denver, Colorado, the Crusade for Justice, Corky Gonzalez. Uh, we also had high school walkouts in Kansas City, Missouri. And there was also a multitude of walkouts that took place in Texas, including Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and Ed Couch, um, uh, Texas as well. But we also had uh, two walkouts take place in the 1970s in Chicago, Illinois. Coupled with walkouts in Tucson at Tucson Union High, uh, Tucson High School, and then 1970 Phoenix Union High School boycott. So as I mentioned, the high school was established in 1895, and then Phillips uh, versus Phoenix Union High School District led to the integration of the high school itself, closing Phoenix Union Colored High School. Then we have students organizing in that time period, right? 1970, the conditions, uh, because the school became an inner city high school where the resources became minimal, the quality of education declined after uh, integration, leading to the conditions uh, where community members, parents, and students saw a need to organize and then move forward on a month-long boycott. And then 1982, the high school eventually closes. So a, a large case called Castro uh, et al. versus Phoenix Union High School uh, really, uh, really kind of just closed the door on this high school itself. So what that meant is that the issues of inequity of racial stratification or racial marginalization at, these school, at this particular school were never addressed. Right? They were kind of swept under the rug. Even looking at district documents, they kind of moved forward in trying to create a culturally inclu inclusive curriculum. But as we see, the high school was still closed because it was a, a, a black and brown inner city high school. So I use critical race theory as uh, one of the focal points to really draw out um, the conversations around race. So I'm really interested in understanding what race has to do with this Phoenix Union High School boycott. Um, and part of the work in doing this educational history research is you know, questions about, well, don't some of the people that have already written about uh, educational history or Chicano Chicano history talk about race? The, the answer is yes, but 
in particular, I really want to focus on drawing out race as a center point to understanding the experiences of these students at Phoenix Union High School during this boycott in 1970. So I look at the centrality of race and racism and intersectionality with other forms of subordination, the challenge to dominant ideology, the commitment to social justice, the centrality of experiential knowledge, and an interdisciplinary perspective. So in addition to that, I coupled it with really getting an idea of what that looks uh, in terms of race and educational history combined. So um, the work of uh, Aguilar Hernandez, uh, Alon um, Luliana Alonso, um, Micaela Mares Tamayo, uh, Ryan Santos, and uh, Dr. Daniel Solorzano, earlier ideas of critical race educational history really present challenges of a, a, a historicism and insist on a contextual historical analysis of education and adopts a stance that presumes that racism has contributed to all contemporary manifestations of group advantage and disadvantage along racial lines. But even more so, more, uh, more uh, current work in regards to critical race educational history really centers on finding an intentionality with the work that we do, right? So what does it mean to do critical race educational history work? Uh, how do we apply it and then be able to create change that's tangible? Um, embodying a collaborative process. So what does it mean to work with those people that were directly involved with the Chicano Chicana boycott uh, of Phoenix Union High School in 1970? And lastly, creating a space for multiple voices to be heard. So I see my work as an avenue for the people who participate in this boycott to, to channel their voices and their experiences. I'm simply a messenger. Um, and I really want to convey and understand what their experiences were in terms of race and racism at this high school. So part of that is creating a, a composite counter story. And the way that I want to do that is using oral history interviews and compiling it with archives. As I mentioned, in this case, I'll be talking about newspapers. But you also will also further elaborate on counter story consisting of three components, personal stories or narratives, other people's stories or narratives, composite stories or narratives. And for me, I, I'm focusing on creating a composite uh, story around the 1970 uh, Phoenix Union High School boycott. So the Phoenix Union High School boycott, in sum, took place after the conditions that were created by the Phillips versus Phoenix Union High School case, as, as I mentioned, uh, a large shift that took place racially at the high school from being predominantly Anglo with some pockets of uh, Chinese American and Mexican American students, but then becoming a predominantly Mexican American, uh, African American black high school. So this re resulted in the ne a neglect of school facilities and educational quality of students were receiving and the negligence was brought to the forefront by the Chicano Chicano in 1968. So the conversations around the issues at this high school didn't just start in 1970. I learned that they started two years prior. So what I'm finding is, is really pushing me to, to push the conversation and look at the, the history in a larger scope as opposed to just 1970. Um, so this led up to a, a month-long boycott of the high school that started on October 9th to November 2nd of 1970. So in the process of this month-long boycott, there was walkouts, there was pickets, there was um, people, um, parents, students, community members attending board meetings, bringing demands to create change and establish change at this high school. Um, the main reason for this month-long boycott as communicated in a lot of the history, primary sources is that there was a lot of racial tension that was, being, uh, that was building up in this high school between uh, African American and Mexican American students. So that within itself really encouraged me to draw out well, what, what is really taking place here in regards to race and racism. Right? What is causing this clash between these two historically marginalized communities in the, uh, from the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area? There are people now in the Phoenix area, a lot of, uh, well, let's say more high schools than there are in the Sorry. Um, I'll skip over that, but um, those were just a few words that I wanted to share of a recording um, by one of the original organizers, Jody Lopez, who was involved with Chicanos por la Causa and the early establishment, but was considered one of the community leaders uh, helping parents organize around these issues of inequity at this high school. 
Um, and he was also a part of a larger group of people that helped to establish an informal high school uh, at a church down the street from Phoenix Union at Immaculate Heart Church that for a month, um, for throughout the month, provided uh, classes, uh, workshops for students that were led by local university students, uh, students that were coming in from other areas, other community organizers, to ensure that students were still receiving the education that they deserved, but also challenging this preconceived notion that the newspapers were, were, were publicizing that the district was continuing to replicate, and that was that these students don't care about education, they don't want to come to school, they're purposely not coming to school, they're not boycotting for any um, uh, insightful reason, they don't know what they're doing. So I've been looking at a lot of archives that really give me perspective in terms of understanding this 1970 Chicano Chicana boycott. That includes documents from the Phoenix Union High School District, Arizona State University Chicano Research Collection, the National Archives, the Library of Congress, uh, NAACP Education and Legal Defense Fund, uh, accessible documents that are provided through the UC system, interlibrary loan system, the Arizona Republic Archives, and the Arizona State Lib uh, Library Archives and Public Records. So in the process of doing this research, I really wanted to focus on talking about the newspaper findings. And for the most part, a lot of the conversations that take place in regards to the newspapers consists uh, within uh, four major local area newspapers, one of them being the Arizona Republic, which is the largest distributing newspaper, followed by the Phoenix Gazette, and then two kind of more smaller local community newspapers, but still got a wide range of distribution in the Valley, the American, and the Scottsdale Daily Progress. Now, in the process, I was always asking myself, is there a counter to this? Is there some type of community-based newspaper like we saw in the 1968 uh, Chicano Chicana East LA walkouts, like La Raza newspaper or Chicano Student News? The closest thing to that in Phoenix was a news, uh, a newspaper called Voice of the City. And Voice of the City really conveyed the political issues, not ju just only for the Chicano Chicana community, but for all communities of color um, in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So some of the things that I've been finding in the, the newspapers themselves range from af affirming messages or really kind of trying to convey clear information about the boycott to messages that are stigmatizing the boycott or downplaying the boycott or minimizing the boycott. Um, and, I, and I break it down into three different categories that I'll talk about in the next slide. But some of the headlines include Chicanos at Phoenix Union High School seek confrontation on racial tensions. Solutions to Chicano Boycott Unresolved. Chicano Boycott School Points Way. So very few newspapers also provided visuals, at least the mainstream ones. It was very rare to see a clear image of protesters followed by some positive or affirming message that didn't minimize the movement or that um, didn't center the voices of administration, for example. But then you have um, uh, headlines like this um, that were featured in the Voice of the City is the Republic trying to create a racial incident. So them having a, uh, an understanding of what the intentions of some of these journalists are in, in inciting more racial tension, more violence at the high school, they're trying to really unpack that and really understand what, what that means in terms of providing a counter to that. And above that, it mentions about 1,500 parents met Tuesday night in the Calderon Ballroom to continue the Phoenix Union High School boycott. And they, they address the impact of the boycott being at $12,000, uh, $12, right? Um, and I want to I point this out because the Calderon Ballroom is one of those historical congregating places uh, for music in South Phoenix for Chicanos and Chicanas and the black community. And at one point, the Justice Department even got um, uh, asked to be involved. Their level of involvement didn't, didn't um, move forward, but they were uh, asked to become involved because it was becoming a very large issue that wasn't seeing any resolution in the eyes of the mainstream media. But some examples of the, the counter to that are um, the Voice of the City newspapers, as I mentioned. So the Voice of the City really provided 
strong examples, visual examples of what the boycott was doing. Um, and this image really stands out because it's an actual image of one of the classrooms at the informal high school established at Immaculate Heart Church. And then very direct images of affirming the, the political participation of students boycotting the Phoenix Union High School. More images, images that you wouldn't see in the mainstream newspapers. And something that's not very much talked about in the mainstream newspapers is the national connection that this, uh, this 1970 boycott was having. And one example of that is um, the participation and support of Jorge Gonzalez um, coming to the Phoenix area, speaking to students who were boycotting at the informal, the informal um, high school at Immaculate Heart Church uh, during the same time that he also did uh, a public speaking engagement at Arizona State University affirming the movement um, by the, the students at Phoenix Union High School. So I broke down my findings into three areas. The first being that there's a dominant narrative that, that's taking place here in most of the newspapers, not including Voice of the City. And that dominant narrative emphasizes certain things. One of those is the, the centering of administrative voices. So it's always, uh, it's always the principal or the superintendent that's speaking on the issue, and when they're speaking on the issue at Phoenix Union High School, it's never addressing the demands or the needs of the students, but it's always minimizing it, right? It's always minimizing the impact of the boycott. It's always minimizing um, the ability of students to really have some type of active voice in creating change. So one example is, um, is found in, a, in one of the newspaper clippings. It's distressing to the Board of Education when students, for any reason, lose opportunity for an education. So this is directly from the school board president, Trevor G. Brown, who was probably one of the more conservative board members in the history of Phoenix education, now has a high school named after him on the, on the west side, which is a predominantly Mexican-American community. Um, in addition, they were also blaming the students for simply seen as an excuse to ditch school, uh, for taking a holiday away from school, so not really caring about their education, just you know, walking out for no purpose and no reason. But there was also counters to that, and the voice of the city really provided that. One of those examples is the establishment of an ad hoc Chicano school board, uh, in addition to the informal high school and boycott um, more than 300 parents, students, and sympathizers that were present. So while the other newspapers, like the Arizona Republic or the Phoenix Gazette, were constantly trying to diminish and saying, you know, the, the impact is low, people are not interested, people are not coming out, the, it's actually the opposite of that. In addition to that, once again, the national support was seen um, for the Phoenix Union High School boycott. Um, and one example is that boycotters connected with Teatro Popular from UCLA, uh, and, um, and they composed Chicano songs together, poetry, a skit, parodying the plight of minority students in the white classroom. And once again, guest speakers such as uh, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez from the Denver Crusade of Justice affirming that their boycott was having a success. But the part that still kind of, um, that really interests me and, and I want to unpack further are the interpretations of race. So across the board in all newspapers, not just the, the more mainstream ones, but also in Voice of the City, there's not really, um, there, I feel like they have to disaggregate and unpack how race and racism is understood. And one of those is that there seems to be a constant battle now between the parents and supporters of African American black students versus the Chicano Chicana boycott. So I'm really trying to understand how does race and racism intertwine with the school at a deeper level that has to do more with the, rela the, the interracial relationships that are taking place in the city at large. So one example of that is uh, racial tensions are at the heart of the problem at Phoenix Union High School, despite words to the contrary expressed by adults. In addition, Ms. Essie Jones and her Boyer, both black leaders, charged Chicanos, the news media, and the school board had all unfairly blamed the black community for campus attacks on Mexican-American students. So when I think about my, my work, um, like I said, this is just a part of a larger piece of research that's developing for my dissertation. You know, I'm looking to culminate, culminate all my archival research and analysis 
commence my oral history interviews, and then begin to place those in conversation with each other to see what kind of counter story is coming about, what, what is really taking place from the perspective of these Chicanos and Chicanas who are involved in this 1970 high school boycott, and how do we really understand race and racism at this high school? And from there, create a composite counter story. And in the larger sphere, I was thinking about implications. So it, I feel like this work is gonna contribute to the larger conversations of educational history of Chicanas, Chicanos, and Chicanx communities, as well as Latinas, Latinos, and Latinx communities. In addition, expanding the conversation and research utilizing critical race educational history, there's a pocket of us that are really trying to move this work forward, and I feel like um, work like mine and my colleagues are really helping to do that. And lastly, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways after, especially after doing the work for this, uh, this conference and this exhibit, what are ways that we can continue to make this history accessible to people? Uh, how do we use it to inform policy? How do we use it to integrate into developing ethnic studies curriculum in K through 12 education? Um, how do we then inform pedagogy to prepare teachers to teach ethnic studies in their classrooms? In addition to that, also, you know, archival materials and research can be access, uh, inaccessible all the time. So I'm trying to think of ways to make it accessible to, for example, to the Phoenix community once I am done with this research um, and be able to take this work back so that way youngsters who were like me in 2006 trying to understand the history of their community really have an avenue to, to understand that. So just wrapping up, these are just some thank you and acknowledgements to people that really helped me to get to where I'm at now. Um, I feel like if it wasn't for them, I can't really be here um, speaking and doing this work, right? Uh, it's not a sole process, but it's, it's a collective effort, um, especially tapping into the last one of uh, those who came before who did the work and sacrificed for me to be here. And those include people that have presented today. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for that opportunity. Some primary sources and contact information in case any, anyone has any questions. And please, I'll be around if anyone has any feedback or, or guidance or support. I'm more than happy to talk about it. Thank you.